Hello. Today I am sitting not in front of my language learning library, but in front of my, my reading library. These books behind me are books that I have for reading literature and history and philosophy and other humanities and Germanic and Romance languages. And I think you can probably see even from a distance that uh, a lot of my books are rather antique. And uh, I have to say, as a bibliophile, I've always had a particular fondness for for used bookstores and the books that you find in them. Uh, sometimes it's nice to be the first owner of a brand new volume, but in general, if books are in good condition and they've got history and character behind them, and uh, there's always something special about uh, finding something that's been long out of print. Um, and so uh, many of my favorite volumes uh, are, are older, uh, just bibliographically. Uh, those of you who love books, just holding this up, I think you might be able to see how incredibly well-made and solid this book of history published in Berlin in 1908 is. And, you know, it's uh, over 115 years old now going on and papers in perfect condition. It's really a handsomely bound and produced thing. There's no reason this shouldn't last another 500 years at least. But the most special thing about this one is when I open it up, I see that this book used to belong to James Henry Breasted. If you don't know who he was, he was one of the most eminent Egyptologists and scholars of antiquity of the earlier part of the 20th century. And he was a longtime professor at the University of Chicago and director of the Oriental Institute. Uh, and so this came into my hands at a book sale at the University of Chicago Divinity School. There's a book sale every spring there for university-wide, I guess, books that are donated to the library and they don't want for some reason and other people donate books. So all sorts of interesting things end up there. So I never really gave much thought to the fact that uh, when I found this, I thought, oh, I'm lucky, but I didn't think it was surprising that it should end up in my hands. But um, now that I think about it, maybe it is because he died in 1935 and I got this in 19, probably about 1990. So uh, 55 years later, this book uh, came into my hands, but it was at the same place and the same time. So I really don't find that that's so surprising. It could have been in somebody else's office for much of that time and eventually made its way to the book sale. For a long time, I've had a what I feel is a really good finding, a, a, an amazing signature in a book um, story that uh, I'm going to tell you now. Uh, and this happened to me probably my freshman, maybe my sophomore year of, of college. Um, I had a good friend named, named Good, Bill Good, uh, from Connecticut, and I was, we were going to school in New York City, and my family's in California, so uh, on, holo on Thanksgiving and other uh, long weekends, I couldn't go home, but he could, and he invited me to his home a couple of times, and uh, on one of these occasions, we went to a, uh, a yard sale, a garage sale, uh, somewhere in Connecticut, and I was leafing through the books and I found uh, this avant-garde Italian novel, translated novel, this interesting, intriguing title, The Dead Boy in the Comets. And I was leafing through this and when I opened it up and looked at the inside cover, I saw a signature that I'd seen my whole life. Ivan Arguez, this, this is my father's signature. I'd found a book that used to belong to my father in Connecticut. And I said, this used to be my father's book. And the guy at the yard sale gave it to me. And that evening I called my father and I told him I'd found that book and that had come into my hands. And we were both just really shocked by that because uh, to the best of his memory, that's a book that he read when he was a teenager. He took to the University of Chicago when he was an undergraduate there. And it inspired him to, to want to learn Italian, that among other things. And once he'd done so, he didn't want the translation anymore. So he, he probably sold that at a used bookstore in Chicago in... Uh, about 1957 or eight or so. Um, and then in about 1983 or 1984, this book somehow made its way all the way, thousands of miles away across the country to someplace in Connecticut uh, where his son just happened to be uh, for once in a lifetime chance and it just happened to land in my hands. I always thought that that was rather incredible. I studied some probability and statistics and stuff like that. and. They tell you that you know, really uh, unusual things, highly unusual things happen all the time. Most of the time we just don't notice them. But uh, here, because there was a signature, it, it landed in my hands. And that might have been, uh, I don't know. I, I do think that that was uh, very, <laughs> very surprising, unusual. But uh, it turns out uh, I've had just as good a story to tell for almost as long. 
And uh, that is something that came to light when I was uh, showed the video of my Germanic resources. And not just one, but two viewers, Scott Hughes and Forrest McMunn, uh, both wrote in to tell me that this dictionary, that even in that video, the old Icelandic dictionary of Zoega, that I'd held up and, and said, uh, thank you, Moberg, Morris Moberg, uh, for leaving me your dictionary. Um, this dictionary, um, it belonged to M. Berg, Morris Berg. He wrote it in the front and in the back. Morris Berg, one time handwriting, one time printed this way. Uh, I'd never had any idea who that was until uh, Scott Hughes and Forrest McMahon told me that uh, he was a pretty interesting character from I mean, also the, the early part of the 20th century. He was, uh, he's been described as the brainiest person ever to play professional baseball. Uh, so a graduate of Princeton and Columbia and uh, knew many languages. And because of that, in World War II, was able to become a spy and do some interesting things in, in, in that regard. And uh, so this book used to belong to him. And I found, I wrote on it, found in 1985. Uh, and so I was about 1985, I was 20 and 21 years old. Uh, and this book, I, I found it on the street in, in, in New York City. And when I say found it, I don't mean it was lying in the middle of the sidewalk as if it had just fallen out of somebody's briefcase, if that had been the case. Um, I would have tried to track him down, Mo Berg, because his name is written so prominently. No, no. What happened was, um, perhaps you can envision uh, sometimes people when they just, I don't know why, they, they just put furniture or old things out in the street for other people to take. And sometimes they sign, you know, free or they're moving and they don't want it. So I was walking down the street uh, in the uh, East 80s, as I remember. Uh, and yeah, these people had put all sorts of furniture and stuff uh, out on the street and signed free and you know, I'm a college student. I was interested in the furniture, but there was this quite lovely steam trunk. It had, you know, it was really characteristic and had wooden slats over a leather cover and handles and, 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 you know, labels from different ships that it had been on it. You know, very beautiful atmospheric antique thing. And it wasn't too big. It was something I thought maybe I could kind of handle and put it, you know, the foot of my bed in my dorm room. Um, so I, I tried to pick it up and it wasn't too heavy, but I could feel that there was stuff inside it. And when I opened it up, it was full of, um, folded cloth. I think it was curtains or drapes or, or sheets or something like that. I had no use for that. So I was taking this stuff out and I felt that there was something solid in it. Uh, and it, it was this book. And, you know, I just looked at it at that point, probably I thought, oh, a dictionary. I'm, I'm, you know, I was evolving into the person that I am. I, I like languages and dictionaries. So, uh, I probably felt through the, the cloth to see if there were any other books in there and there weren't. So, uh, there was just this one book wrapped up in drapes and this big old steam trunk and some other furniture that was put on the street in the East eighties in New York city in 1985, when I happened to be walking down the street. So as I recall, I, uh, kind of struggled in the street to the corner and Tried to get a taxi. A regular taxi was too small, but they had this big old checker cabs. So I could get it in that. And yeah, I, I got it back to my room. And I, you know, I was, used that trunk to store stuff in for a while. But probably when I got there, I probably took a better look at this and thought, you know, old Icelandic, whatnot. And at that stage, 1985, I was already studying Latin and Greek and Sanskrit and had an ideal of becoming a old fashioned comparative philologist. But uh, I don't for the life of me believe that I had any, any idea or any specific plan of, of ever learning Old Icelandic, Old Norse, which of course I did at the University of Chicago in coming years, uh, I would end up writing my dissertation using this dictionary to great degree. Uh, this dictionary uh, was uh, an incredible help to me. I mean, most of the time I, I sat in the library or in my room and I used this much larger Icelandic English dictionary, Kleesby, Vignans and Craig dictionary. But um, when you were, you know, Want to put this in your briefcase and, and walk around and maybe do some reading or studying in a coffee shop or some other place. This one's much more portable. And at that stage, I, I got into the habit. So I used this book very assiduously when I was um, doing the, the research for my dissertation. Uh, so for about maybe two years, I carried this book around with me. And every time I used it, you know, I got into the habit of, you know, I'd say, oh, thank you. Thank you, Moberg, for leaving me your dictionary. But like I said, I never knew who he was. Uh, Prominent polyglot, uh, interesting character. I guess this is probably his his handwriting here next to the writing on it. That's not mine. 
Um, so I don't. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm reading now, leading reading in discussion circles on uh, the great books, and we're reading people like Plutarch's Lives, and we read Thucydides and uh, Herodotus, and those old historians. You know, all those books are are full of omens and portents and 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 signs and visions. And of course, my rational self doesn't believe in anything like that. But I don't know. You just kind of have to wonder that book that belonged to some preeminent quirky polyglot happens to land in the hands of somebody else, I'm not a spy or a baseball player, but probably pretty quirky and I do my best to be a polyglot. So that his book should land right in my hands. Seems kind of like a portent. I mean, guiding spirit saying study old Norse. Maybe that's why I did it. All right. I've got this book. I hope that was an interesting story and inspires you to look at your old books and, and look at the signatures there. And maybe you don't know who the person was, but uh, maybe someday you'll find out and we'll have an interesting story. So thank you, Moberg, for leaving me your old Icelandic dictionary.